Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's doing okay. Welcome to another Monday. Um, we have an amazing program for you today, and we're very excited to, to have you um, watching this, this presentation over Zoom, Magic of, of the Internet. Um, the, we're very glad to have um, Maria Tsuka presenting her talk, Exploring Responsive Type. Uh, my name is Alexander. I am one of the instructors in the Type of Cooper uh, program. Uh, I am also the curator of the lecture series. And so this is the Herbal Ballon lecture series, which uh, has uh, a series of talks that run concurrently with the extended program, uh, which is part of Type of Cooper, which uh, if you're not familiar with Type of Cooper, it's the postgraduate certificate program in typeface design uh, here at Cooper Union. Um, there's uh, lots of other uh, workshops around type calligraphy, lettering, uh, and typography. Uh, and if you're interested in that, um, you can check out the program at the link. I'm going to try to do my usual um, double duty of trying to keep uh, chat uh, lively and active and, and post all the links that uh, come up as, as a relevant links so you have them handy. Um, the, um, the first thing uh, I want to uh, note is the um, lecture is being recorded. Uh, so if you if you uh, wanted to watch this again, they will be available in a couple of weeks. And uh, I wanted to uh, thank Type Culture for allowing us the um, recording of these and to build uh, and continue to add to this extensive archive of lectures that we have going back now about seven years of, of lectures. We have close to 70 lectures uh, in this archive. So if you wanted to see um, the lectures that we've had, if you missed anything, um, uh, if this is new to you, um, you can go back several years and see uh, a great deal of very, very interesting lectures around type and typography. Um, you can find more uh, lectures on our archive page, and I will post that into the chat as well. Um, I also want to make a note of, um, there's the link if you wanted to take a screenshot of that, and that's also in the chat. Um, we have one more lecture coming up in the summer um, that's going to be on um, July 25th uh, at 6.30. It will be a lecture by Diego Weinsman and Gary Munch. Uh, it's called Type is Alive. It's a really great uh, view of um, inscriptional lettering on, on gravestone markers all across the world. So it's going to be kind of a very, very interesting like look at that, the history of, and of, of those, and also just the stylistic differences globally of, of these inscriptions. Um, that will be in person. Uh, as well as Zoom. So this is our first summer where we're doing hybrid talks. We have a few talks that are completely on Zoom, and we have a few that are in person. And if you are able to come and see them in New York, you can do that at 6.30 here at Cooper Union, 41 Cooper Square, but there also will be uh, live streaming the same way through the Zoom webinar. So that's on July 25th. Um, and then we will have uh, another uh, four lectures in the fall when the program resumes in October. So keep an eye out for our announcements, join our mailing list, keep a, an eye on the social media, you'll see the four lectures that we will be announcing um, for the fall of uh, this year. And then another four in, in the spring and then another four in the summer and then we'll just keep, 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 keep going. So without further ado, I wanted to again welcome you to, to today's presentation, um, uh, Exploring Responsive Type. And I wanted to introduce our speaker today, uh, Maria Tsuka, who is currently in Barcelona, but she is uh, based in Brooklyn. Uh, she's a designer and developer who works on fonts and websites and tools. Uh, she designs fonts and develops type-oriented tools at Occupant Font. Fonts, uh, which is a Providence-based type foundry. She's also independently collaborating with organizations and artists on various uh, typographic projects. Her work has been published on Walker Art Center, The Gradient, uh, AIGA Eye and Design, Fast Company, Communication Arts, Motherboard, and Hacker News. Uh, her type design education began as a graduate student at the Rhode Island uh, School of Design, where she now teaches type and programming related courses. Marie holds a BA in, the, in interdisciplinary studies from the University of Chicago and is originally from Yokohama, Japan. So please uh, welcome Marie to our virtual stage. Thank you, Marie, for joining us. 
Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you um, the Type at Cooper team for helping organize this talk. Um, so to introduce myself, I guess a little more, you already covered this, but I am a type designer at Oxpin Fonts, um, along with Cyrus Highsmith and Victoria Russian. Uh, I teach some classes around um, type and web design. I also work as a freelance graphic designer, web developer. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen on today's talk. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip ahead to this. I'm fairly new to type design um, and I've had more experience as a type user um, than a type maker um, of sorts. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, and um, so today I'll be sharing a little bit about my recent release, um, Pentameter, but I'll also be exploring how we think about typefaces and how we use typefaces. Um, and I think the distinction between those two roles, type designer and typographer, has always been fluid. Um, and even more so with variable fonts. Um, in another uh, Herb Lubin lecture series talk, uh, David Jonathan Ross or DJR states that variable fonts represent an opportunity to reinvent the relationship between me, the type designer and my user. And, and we work together to make typography. I thought this was a really great statement and interesting um, approach to think about the possibilities of variable fonts. Um, and his lecture, by the way, is a great introduction to variable fonts if you all haven't checked it out yet. So variable fonts offer a, a myriad of opportunities that allow an incredible level of control over typographic expression. Um, here we have a microsite designed by Min Kyung Kim for a typeface occupant old style. Um, this was designed by Cyrus Highsmith um, back in uh, 2020. Cyrus designed this font for long form tests, often testing betas on Kindles um, during the design process. And so this website refers back to that design process and um, Min Kyung developed an e-reader for visitors to read Cyrus's text inside paragraphs on the website. And as a variable font, the weight axis is fluidly variable. Um, and moreover, it's especially useful in scenarios where you can invert the background color. Here we can fine tune um, the, the, the color of the relationship between the text in the foreground and the background color when the colors are inverted. Typefaces might also respond to other typefaces. Um, Occupant Fonts is a brand of a large Japanese type design company called Morisawa Japan. And we've been exploring ways to collaborate um, since Occupant Fonts was acquired by Morisawa. And so this counterparts project is one where we're experimenting with combinations of different typefaces across um, different foundries. Here we have Magmatic paired with MB101 uh, which is a classic Morisawa typeface. And even though the Japanese typeface isn't a variable font, um, because Magmatic is a variable font, it can adjust and pair and um, refine the weight to be consistent with the Japanese typeface. Many type designers and typographers have already explored um, these possibilities of typographic refinement, typographic finesse. Here, Stephen Nixon raises the advantages of typographic micro interactions here with recursive. We also have optical sizing here shown with CJ types Louvette, where we have a higher contrast and tighter spacing for the larger optical sizes. Pixel Ombud specimen for undercase type sconces demonstrates how optical sizing might benefit hierarchies in digital typesetting. 
DJR and the lecture mentioned previously also raise the possibilities of of using narrower type or narrower screens here shown in Gimlet. And this device responsivity can be made even more fluid and smooth with tools like Scott Kellen's Type Tura, which animates those transitions across device width. We see DJR's Roslindale transforming from a more condensed display cut to a robust text space in the narrower widths. Scott Cullen describes these moves as practical responsive typography. And it's clear that variable fonts allow us to effectively respond to our devices and browsers for typographic refinement and control. They open up potential for finesse as a typographer. What I'm interested in discussing with you all today though is type that responds to context beyond the browser, um, beyond functional needs. We might even call this impractical responsive typography. In her rant on technology, Ursula Le Guin, a science fiction writer, states that technology is the active human interface with the material world. At the fundamental level, fonts as a piece of technology epitomizes this definition in that it carries language, the way which we interface with each other. And what's interesting about an interface is that it's a two-way medium. Not only does type denote the ways we understand things, but the physical world or our materials also informs the shapes of letter forms. Here we have Bjorn Carmen's Occlusion Grotesque, where he carved letter forms into the bark of a tree and observed its transformation over the course of five years. It is a project that challenges how humans are terraforming and controlling nature to our own desires, quote, which has become problematic to an almost unreversible state. This project, this project manifests a role reversal in which the tree's growth determines the design space of the letter forms instead of the designer controlling the expression. This provocation to consider our relationship to environment is increasingly urgent today However, letter forms adapting to the physical qualities of natural materials is nothing new. It's unnecessary to artificially impose such a direct relationship with carbon letters into trees. In fact, the shape of letters have always responded to their material medium. Baskerville's high contrast design was only enabled by his development of high quality paper that can absorb the ink on delicate metal type. Heavy slabs of wood type prevent the serifs from breaking upon the pressure of printing. Across the world, the diversity of Brahmi scripts reflects the range in forestry. In Northern India, paper formed with the brittle texture of Himalayan birch gave structure to the more angular lines that you see in the Northern regions. Whereas in South India, the softer bark of palm trees lends itself to the more curvilinear strokes. So there have always been a direct relationship between the physicality of materials and the resulting letter forms. And now much of our writing exists on the screen and our typefaces are constructed digitally on the computer. How might these fonts reflect our physical environment? In Helvetica on the earth.ttf, artist Wei Li applies gravity quite um, literally or figuratively um, onto her letters. In the project description, she notes how a lot of websites defy gravity with a pull to the top left corner. Um, to counter this, she introduces this JavaScript to simulate a grounding force on her letters. And also technically in HTML, images and text automatically flow from that corner. With this typeface, she states, gravity is our partner again. Using digital fonts to express physicality seems like an inherent contradiction. However, I believe that in order to reflect the world outside our screens, it's useful to examine what we actually see on our screen. There is a note in Lee's, Wei Li's project description that gives us a hint. She notices this as an art object, how small the work is just 67 kilobytes, bytes. 
bytes are our material for digital fonts. With any website, fonts are a network resource transferred as data over the internet. In fact, this was the motivation to develop variable font technology in the first place. Um, we wanted to compress multiple styles into a single file so that a large type family can be loaded through a single data request. So we used to only be able to use web safe fonts installed on everyone's computer. And while we now have access to load our on, own fonts with any web page, those browser defaults still exist. The solar powered website, for example, utilizes these defaults to minimize the data load and energy use on the server. And here, my standard default setting for serif typefaces is time, so that's what it's showing, but you can adjust that in your browser settings. And at the root of our computers is a system of zeros and ones, and so are our digital typefaces. Our raw material for digital typography is bytes. And at the same time, anything can be represented in data as we found virtually to our detriment in our age of surveillance capitalism. But instead of capturing patterns of behavior for economic gain, perhaps we can use data to listen to the world around us. Data can be a connective medium between digital type and physical conditions. It allows us to interface not only with the computer system, but also with a computer's capacity to access the world. And I'd like to share some various strategies in which physicality can be embodied via data inputs. And this data can take any form. Back in 1990, Eric Van Blockland and Yus van Rossum pioneered taking advantage of the digital construction of typefaces by introducing randomness in the code for FF available. But now with the ability to design with any custom axis with variable fonts, it's even easier to programmatically transform letters as a response to anything. It does not need to be random. It can be any form of data input. Letter forms can partner with whatever they wish. It might partner with the quality of sound. German phenomenologist Wolfgang Kohler, who is known to have contributed to the creation of gestalt psychology, documented our perception mapping between speech sounds and the visual shape of objects. This is known as the Bubakiki effect. Designer Emi Takashi expands on this with her Kachibua typeface. They might partner with natural phenomena. Is the sound not showing? Oh, okay. Sorry. Let me go back to that so that the sound can be displayed. Cut. Bua. Catch, 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 yes, catch. Yes. Okay. Bua. Sorry about that. Catch, bua. Catch, 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 catch. Bua, 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 bua. Bala 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 bala
Kiki, 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 K
web of multinational corporations, proprietary applications, read-only devices, search algorithms, content management systems, WYSIWYG editors, and digital publishers, it becomes an increasingly radical act to hand code and self-publish experimental web art and writing projects. While this was part of her 2015 piece, The Handmade Web, it rings true even more so today with the rise of templated, templated automated work. Hand coding has been a large part of my work in creating websites. By taking more time, the making becomes more about the process rather than the outcome. And we can appreciate the act of writing code itself. Hand coding can be slow and at times frustrating, but it provides us the capacity to choreograph imaginative interactions and inventions. It can be a way to eschew the assumptions and values built into existing tools. It can be an act of resistance against the pressures of productivity. Artist, writer, and Professor Laurel Schulz notes in her initiative, HTML Energy, that building websites has become complex, but the energy of HTML persists. With this in mind, I wanted Pentameter to carry the quirk of a personal letter while referring to technical purposes. In order to allude to the intimacy of handwriting, I drew the Roman as an upright italic with exaggerated tail endings and abrupt inflections. These insert a cadence in the typeface rhythm, which helped inspire the namesake pentameter. In the drawing process, I first began by designing a proportional version of the letters and then gradually applying tension and friction as I adjusted them into fixed width forms. I expanded the design space to a weight, width, and slant axis. And I wanted this typeface to allude to the idea of handwriting, but still refer to typographic digital use. So unlike script or typewriter font that often mimic printed effects, I wanted this typeface to feel native to the screen. So it stays true to a monolinear, rigidly vectorized typographic structure. Instead of treating this effort as a revival, I sought to balance digital materiality with the warmth I saw from Aldine. Stroke edges are sharp and the skeletal frame remains stiff. The clunkiness that results is the opposite of an efficient typeface, but I thought that the slowing down might offer room for reflection. Considering these origins, I thought the ideal use for pentameter would be digital poetry. Because it is so exaggerated, it would be better to typeset a collection of shorter strings rather than long form text. So in order to proof pentameter, I created a website that uses an API to pull random poems. Another benefit of this tool was that being able to, I was able to see the typeface with various languages and rhythms. Once it was time to release the typeface, I played with the concept of pitch in the sketch for the landing page of occupant fonts. In monospace typefaces, pitch denotes the width at which a monospace typeface is fixed. So here the width animates across beats thanks to Cyrus's drum synthesizers. In condensed versions with a narrow pitch, Condensed versions with a narrow pitch have a more rapid rhythm while the wider pitch moves more slowly across the page. And coincidentally, audio physics works similarly. When you slow down a tone, it has a lower pitch and when you speed it up, it's higher. Returning to the spe specimen site, I wanted to refer to the origins of poetry in a public space. Oro Schulz, who I mentioned previously with the project of HTML Energy, is interested in quote, the in po poetic potential of the web. And so I felt like she would be the ideal collaborator for the specimen site. Laurel orchestrated the website Seasons in Pentameter, which showcases the current season of the 72 micro seasons in Japan. 
As part of the traditional calendar, the year is divided up into a series of five day seasons, each demarcated with a descriptive period. The website first displays the current season and then continues through the year. I originally, even though I'm from Japan, didn't know about these micro seasons, um, but I love the idea of understanding these seasons through a five day rhythm. Each season read like the beginning of a haiku. And Laurel perfectly captured the intentions behind pentameter by expressing the nuances between the larger seasons of the year, where we can pay attention to how we feel time. And so the font weight corresponds to the temperatures during the times of the year, hot and heavy during the summer months, and cold and thin in the winter. Because the weight axis is variable, we're able to map the progression of seasons as a smooth gradient. Tiger Dingsung is a graphic designer and web developer who often incorporates audio compositions in his work. When Laurel suggested each season might have an associated tone of sorts, we immediately thought of Tiger's work. His digitally lyrical MIDI tones resonated well with the squarely vectorized italics of pentameter. Tiger composed the audio for each of the seasons by, by deconstructing the original characters that you see here on the right and then synthesize those into a five second loop. So when all the seasons are played all the way through, we have a 365 second piece. I'll play through some of these now, hopefully the audio will work. There are largely two approaches to experimental responsive typography. One in which a variable font technology is used to express a conceptual range. At times, these result in designs that are less typefaces and more illustrations. They take advantage of the variable font format to harness animations on the screen. The second approach is that you can take any the axis of an existing variable font and program it to perform a computed or interpretive visualization. So sliders are just a starting point in accessing properties of variable font formats. And as I mentioned before, any form of data can be used to control the expression of a typeface. In static fonts, design can capture physicality and shapes, such as in calligraphic qualities, ink traps, rounded corners, et cetera, to simulate printed effects. But with variable fonts, we can take a new approach. We can reference physicality not only in the way it is designed, but also in the way these shapes transform and behave across these axes. The beauty of, of variable typefaces is that they are tools to be reused over many contexts, not simply illustrations, and their expression is not tied to one instance. Even if a variable typeface is designed to pursue a specific typographic inquiry when pipe up to other data, it can refer to a whole new world. Magmatic uh, 2020 occupant font release by Cyrus and former member Jun Shin was an exploration in typographic extremes, testing the limits of how much a design space can remain consistent. This wide range became a useful tool for a website I created with Min Kyung called Radio M. And this was a website where I combined those two approaches that I mentioned. Radio Amyan Sonic Transmissions of Care in Ocean Space was a project created for artist Joel Toms. Every month, Joel commissions and relays new, com new compositions by contemporary artists through his Sonic platform. It was in, in collaboration with a science team from Ocean X Works. 
Ocean Network Canada. This is what the sonic platform looks like. And it is submerged 2,500 meters deep in the Pacific Ocean in the Cascadia Basin. The moon as an entity with which the ocean has an intimate relationship became the conceptual framework for the site. During the three days around the full moon, the website becomes a radio which you can turn into, tune into the month's piece. So this is when you uh, approach the website on, during the full moon. When you visit the website when it is not in a full moon, all you see is the current phase and the next transition date. This is a recorded time lapse of what you might see over the course of a month. The name of the website, Radio Amnion, corresponds to these phases set in magnetic. During the full moon, magnetic is at its maximum width. And during the new moon, it's, it is at its most compressed, barely visible. The moon itself is actually also a variable glyph with a phase axis. This is using variable font technology as an animation format. I created a custom phase axis so that we would have access to all points of the phases of the moon through this single glyph. We design letter forms with vector curves, math in other words. In theory, they contain an infinite number of points. But in practice, digital, vis well, digital visual representation has embodied a friction between this conceptual computational infinite and the physical medium. Our screens have evolved from a tapestry of black and white bits to high res retina displays. At the end of the day, however, even maximum screen resolution is still an emulation of the infinite through advanced rasterization techniques. But in a sense, conceptually, we now have access to the infinite with variable axes. Given two endpoints, we have access to all points in between. I wonder if this makes it easier to respond to real world contexts like the way our seasons change across the year or a moon might gradually wax and wane. Many things in our world are non-binary, but rather a complex gradient of colors filtered through each of our perspectives. I'm curious how access to typographic nuances might enable nuanced representations of the world. And perhaps having access to these points in between Variable font technology can help us bring closer to such contexts in real life. And perhaps they can help us interface with the worlds outside of our screens. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. That's, that's really, really great uh, way to end it. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see how um, how broad the applications of responsive fonts can be. And I, I think hopefully the folks watching um, are inspired by, by the potential that, uh, that this opens up. Cause I think we sometimes uh, get a little too locked in into like the box of like the use of the fonts, which is like usually pretty immediate in terms of like setting text. And uh, this is like a really eye opening. Um, the experience to see like the, the broader applications so if folks have questions send them into the q a window um they might get lost a little bit in the um in the chat window but i will do my best to see if i can spot some in the chat but if you can folks uh please send them into the q a um oops i think we just lost marie oh, no um we'll give her a second uh to see if we can 
see if we can it's just hopping right on the the and unpredictability of uh <laughs> of, of the internet we'll give her a second to to rejoin us but if you have uh, questions folks uh, maybe type them into the chat window while we wait for marie to join us let's see if i can like She was having a little bit of internet ish connecting connection issues towards the end. Let's see if we can get her back. There's me. Hi. Hi. Sorry, my internet is being a little weird. No worries. No worries. Um, yeah, um, uh, I just asked folks to send in some some questions. Uh, I did have one question um, in in terms of kind of like the the the, the way that um, you ended the presentation, showing those those the wonderful projects especially like including sound in it. That's just such a profoundly simple idea, but it makes so much sense to see the variations in sound in, in, the, in the programmatic way that electronic sounds are made. So it is just a series of, of waves and it's completely logical to, to, um, to link it to, to type. I'm curious in, in terms of the, your experience and like what you see in the field, like do you see more... Um, ideas, possibilities, perhaps, uh, in the future variable fonts. So do you see the inspiration for these ideas coming more from the designers of the type? Or do you see that? Is it? Do you know what I mean? Like, if, if, if who's pushing? Yeah, it I, mean, I think that's uh, an interesting question. And I, it can, I think it can really go both ways. Like, I, with, for example, my students at RISD, they, they basically do both. They're designers, but they're learning how to make type and they're sort of experimenting with these lead, weird letter forms um, that kind of convey an idea. And, you know, they're, some of them are less more typefaces than illustrations, as I kind of mentioned. Um, but then I could feel like those can potentially inspire type designers to then maybe think of a new approach to a new design or kind of think of, of ways to develop responsivity. And specifically, I think with sound, um, there's kind of an interesting parallel, I feel, where there is a lot of both sort of like straddling the physicality of things as well as the digital material with um, digital sound production. Um, like there, for me, like when that moment, when I was playing with the pitch of like the width of pentameter and making it wider. And then for me that it also reads slower when the text is wider. But then I also noticed that, you know, when you make, when I was making the, the audio uh, slower, it gets lower. And like, there's all these sort of like synesthetic qualities that happen, I think with, with sound. Um, that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I, at, the, at the end, I think it's also uh, really about like a collaboration. Um, I think just there is an opportunity um, like DJR mentioned for really new ways of working together with as a designer and as a type designer. Um, and I think that that's the really exciting part. Um, like for me, my collaboration with um, 
like Laurel and Tiger for me was a, a really great experience and that they had really great ideas about like the design and how things might function. Um, I also ended up adding some things in the typeface that sort of responded to some of the needs of the website. Um, and it was kind of a, a really like a two way uh, collaboration that in that sense. Um, and I was also involved in developing the website as well. So that, that was a nice part of that collaboration. Mm -hmm. In terms of the, like, do you, do you have a sense of, um, of what you would want to see happen in the field of responsive web? I'm uh, sorry, re well, responsive fonts, <laughs> the responsive web. Yeah, that's, um, I, I always I do that too when I, when I teach it. Like I type and web become interchangeable words. <laughs> um, which, yeah, now they're merged. So, you know, we have. The... Yeah. But, I mean, it, I, I think what's more, what's exciting for me is less so, like I'm not specifically looking for anything, but I think it's just like expand like thinking of it in a more expansive way and opening up the possibilities. Um, and I think the, the fact that we have sort of access to this fluid design space, I think can offer opportunities for some really interesting ways to, to express um, that can be quite personal or subjective too. Um, like, I, I added the, the last, I was kind of thinking about that when I, when I put Penelope Umbrico's project at the end where it's sunsets from Flickr, which all kind of, you think would be all the same, but they're all slightly different. And, and I was kind of thinking of how we, as type designers and designers, human beings, we all have these like very individual perspectives um, that, could be perhaps like expressed um, with nuance with a format that allows for these kind of gradients. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's a question that that I think mm -hmm. relates to something that, that you're saying. Uh, it's a question from Puria uh, Jahanshani. Uh, Jahanshahi, um, is your interest in responsive type uh, and sound more towards the pragmatic da data based uh, productions like human interface, social needs, et cetera, or more of an artistic exploration in the unknown? Hmm. I think. There, there are great uses for both of those scenarios. I think personally for me, I've been more curious about exploring a little bit, like being able to access parts of the environment that maybe I didn't know about, or maybe I wasn't able to specifically um, pay attention to um, through data and through potentially representing through variable forms. Uh, like I think with the seasons and pentameter project, for example, like I, I didn't know that there was such a fine tune like division in the seasons of the year and how you can kind of like pay attention to how the, the year changes just like within five days at a time. And the fact that that can now be like data to then be expressed visually, I feel like it's a nice way that I can then kind of explore this, this way of experiencing time that I, I had, didn't have access to before. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there are many ways to do that, that I think could be really interesting. It's also interesting, like how, that makes um, sense. yeah, yeah. I think it's also what's, what's interesting in that particular project too, is like the possibilities of a type specimen you know like how um the it's always like the type specimen is always like a way to show off how the typeface operates and obviously kind of like its sweet spots like what it's great at like the how it mm -hmm. sets the textures you know and like with with this new field of of variable fonts like it, it kind of in a way transforms the the notion of a type specimen as well you know kind of it, it, it mm -hmm. becomes much more of a there, it, it's showing off, of course, but it's like it's almost like expressive in and in, in of itself. You know, I, I'm, I'm very kind of curious how uh, the 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 type specimen that like, are going to be coming out by type designers making responsive uh, uh, variable fonts rather um, will 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 we'll make interesting things mm -hmm. as, as a field. Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, I kind of had the luxury of doing that because I already have more of like the 
practical information about the typeface on the main Occupant Files website. Also distribution for us is handled with Type Network. So that in a way was also liberating for me to kind of explore this type specimen, not necessarily as a type specimen site, but a website that kind of creates a world for the font to live in. Um, and to a certain extent, I think that some people might argue that that maybe that is that limits a typeface to like that you're already kind of like attaching. Um, mm -hmm. you, maybe you, you want a sort of like a more neutral way to present a web uh, a typeface, and I think that that's also effective as well. I guess um, since you know it's a tool that you want to be usable by many people. Right. Um, but yeah, I think there are, there are benefits to both approaches. Mm -hmm. Well, I think like it, it, the the more expressive kind of ex um, poetic side of things, I think in, is opens up other possibilities for other designers. You know, I think I think you're right. It's like mm -hmm. you know, the the uh, the more practical kind of uh, applications is 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 what's expected, and people can decide whether or not that typeface fits their requirements of whatever they're trying to do. But I feel like. The, the, the there's always this chance this opportunity to, to plant a seed somewhere in someone's mind like that might be not the typeface but let's say it's a type designer who will make a, a typeface based on this idea of its relationship to sound and and, and mm -hmm. uh, or experience i think it's like a i just keep thinking of the project that um eric uh, um and used did years ago for the twin cities like the the um, the typeface that responded to wind and temperature in the Twin Cities, you know, it's something that like was done mm -hmm. way ahead of the the curve in terms of mm -hmm. responsive web uh, and yeah. real fonts. I mean, it was a website that could gather the data, real time data, and then you know um, display the font using that mm -hmm. data. Seeing how that could work um, today with 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 variable fonts, it would be fascinating yeah. because that project could be remade um, and and easily. It's just like, I, I always think about the projects that they did and you showed Beowulf um, design. I think mm -hmm. those ideas are always like uh, forward thinking uh, and, and, and spur mm -hmm. ideas. It might take five years, 10 years or two years or two months for someone to like get inspired. But I, I, I feel like those, those projects are always incredible in terms of eye opening, especially like um, your practice in teaching students as well. I think that's, that's kind of where the, the mm -hmm. friction, like the, the possibilities really open up. Yeah. Um, I mean, Eric yeah. and Yust, yeah, I feel like I totally agree that one of the early, like very early on, they realized that digital typefaces have potential because of the fact that they're digital and like access to that code is something that I think they've really leveraged super, really um, super nicely, I think, like with that project that you mentioned. Um, and it also kind of showcases like you can, any it's anything is possible in a way. Um, it's just kind of like the capacity to like think of what you want to plug with what I think it's, it's almost, yeah, at that level. Yeah, yeah. Um... There was a question uh, in the Q&A uh, from Thomas Ladd. Uh, do you know of any examples of designers working with responsive uh, type uh, in public spaces that respond to environmental prompts, such as noise, wind, or heat with digital sensors? I mean, that sounds like a great project. I mean, what you mentioned with the Twin Cities is, I think, a great example of that. Um, I think the question about it being displayed in public spaces, I think is also interesting. Um, when Laurel and I were talking about this site, we actually initially wanted to, um, or we still want to see if there's a way that we can insert the website back into a, a very public space, like have install a digital, or have a way to kind of contact the people who are involved in the digital sort of panels on subways to see if we can actually put the website up there to kind of like complete the circle of inserting it back into the public. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always looking also for more examples. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, I think, but those inputs are also great 
um, ideas, like things that lends itself well to being programmed into a response from type like temperatures, wind. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting too, in terms of like the kinetics, like the the human motion, Mm -hmm. like the, I remember there were several pieces like in the, in New York subway and, and you brought up like the poetry in, 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 in the subways. I think that um, just the experience of being in the subway and commuting to some place, you, you sort of see it as a transitory experience and it, it, it's rare, you know, it's, it's rare and lovely when we can kind of break out of that space and like kind of become aware that we're with other humans in that, <laughs> in that space. And there's mm-hmm. something uh, magical about being just with, with people even if it's not, uh, if, if we kind of see just as a routine that we're going on, but like that, that, that popping out of that space. And I just feel like that there's, there's been kind of a lot of artists who have tried to um, create experiences within the subways, especially kind of the moving, like I, mm-hmm. I feel like there's been like sound sculptures that sort of would react to, to people moving through the mm-hmm. space and, and how something might, might get just their movement, like one person versus like several people kind of moving, triggering um, sensors in space that kind of mm-hmm. would set off sounds or just the wind flow yeah. of the train cars moving, kind of creating the, um, there's, there's just seems to be a lot of, uh, a lot of really interesting possibilities of how um, these very, very public spaces could, could become uh, much more vibrant. And especially now with like the digital advertising mm-hmm. technology, like the screens are kind of everywhere. Right. It's just super, super interesting to think about the, the possibilities. Um, um, let me see if there's any other questions that... Um, uh, uh, there was a question. Um, it, it, what were um, the, some of the challenges you faced when bringing uh, variable fonts and sound together? Is there anything that, that was like... Comp- um, unusual unexpected and and, uh, what was the hardest part about that I think well for me um I kind of think of myself as like an amateur programmer or amateur coder and I think I sort of alluded to that a little bit uh, earlier in my talk and one of the challenging things too, when you start digging deeper and like sort of revealing the later layers of what you see to understand how things actually work and what things, what's actually going on, it, it, the rabbit hole can get very deep very quickly. Um, like I, even in that sketch that I was trying to create for um, with the pitch, uh, initially I, I wanted something that was like even more direct. Right now, the sound is just overlaid on top of the um, the the animation with the text, um, and the slider is is what kind of triggers the the, the different effects. But initially, I wanted a, a more direct relationship between like the sound and the axis input axis of the typeface for example and then I I was all of a sudden I kind of had to become like a sound engineer or like trying to figure out how like synthesizers work and how generating like waves of audio like it it got really kind of technical very quickly (laughs) Mm -hmm. and so I kind of had to pull back a little bit but I mean that can be a challenge but it could also be an opportunity I think to to learn about how things work um, and I think that's also been kind of a, a draw for me with this, these technologies is that maybe there's a way for us to create things that help us learn how they work almost. Um, mm-hmm. um, there's a, there's a, one question that was in the chat I noticed uh, from Ricard Garcia. Do you think that using axes like optical size or, or weight can improve accessibility on the web? I mean, certainly the it, it optical size you know improves mm-hmm. reading. Um, do you think like it, it will have or has already had an effect on accessibility on the web? And which I think is like a very big topic altogether. Yeah, it's. I mean, I, I'm not uh, an expert on this, but I can imagine um, having legible type that not only responds to, you know, like your typical like headlines are more con- 
you know, tighter letter spacing, like smaller text is wider spaced, et cetera. Like, I think that setting itself, I think what's legible is depends on the person who's viewing it. So in a sense, if that responsivity cannot not only respond to that typographic level, but also the power Ability. But I also do know that this has a lot to do with kind of like the underlying layer of like the structure of the HTML and things like that, um, having proper alt text and making sure that like the code itself is semantically written. Um, and I think that's also something that's brought up in that HTML energy project as well as um, this project called uh, alt text um, as poetry, where sort of the description text for images is given much more consideration um, in order for visually um, impaired people to experience the visual or, or at least understand what is the visual landscape of the website. Um, and I, I also think that with optical sizing, I, I, I I'm still like kind of experimenting about how that might that might work well. Um, since it's on one hand, it's great to have that embedded automatically, where if you just like, you know, select 18 point, it your typeface adjusts to 18 point. I guess on the on the screen it would be more like pixels um, or EMs. But I also do know that whenever you make an assumption about how things should look, there's always gonna be exceptions. And so I think it would also be about like, like how easy it is to make sure that you can override those exceptions and how deeply embedded those kind of technical kind of decisions get packaged into the typeface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still, there's there's still, as as um, consistent as as browsers have become, there's still a lot of mm -hmm. variety of how people see yeah. the information. You know, screen size. Mm -hmm. So much information is now being pulled by phones, and so the 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 way that we experience that is is so different from mm -hmm. the desktop and big screen. It's like, um, like it's it's um, you know, it's it's uh it's a big it's a big field but uh hopefully things are kind of becoming a little bit more consistent and i think like one thing that's also exciting i think to think about is like the uh the space of apps which essentially kind of mini browsers essentially it's like you know it, it's a it's a scripted space but it's yeah. constructed to almost function like a little browser and that's a little yeah. bit more um, predictable in terms of like how someone might experience mm -hmm. it on, on their device, um, you know, and like the right. use of that. Um, there was one question from Christopher Swift that just came in in terms of the how these fonts are used in print, which I think again is like a bigger a bigger question. But um, mm. uh, I, I think this the simpler uh, answer is the could these be scripted to to be uh, used in InDesign? I'm Christopher, if, if I'm kind of interpreting the question in, in terms of just the, the variable fonts, like they're already in InDesign, the slide is already there. And so, you know, the the optical size, uh, most of the typefaces, at least in this space, are kind of optical size driven. And you can certainly pull the sliders and, you know, adjust the type if it's really mm -hmm. small or if, you, if you're doing something much bigger. Um, and certainly more uh, adventurous uh, um, axes of of certain typefaces are also accessible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think like for print, it's already here. You know, I think like th that, that's a much more stable media, of course. Um, it's not as poetic or that, that's not to say mm -hmm. it's not poetic, it's just different. Uh, but I, I think that's, that would be yeah. an answer maybe, but I'm, I'm curious if, if um, I mean, to me, I, I kind of think back to the idea of the substrate and the medium and like with print, like how type sits on the page depends on so many factors, you know, it's like how it's printed, like, you know, what, whether it's an inkjet or a laser, like how, what the quality of the paper is and like, you know, whether it maybe some of the, it's a little more reflective or it's the color of it. I think all of those, this is a kind of like more of a tech practice 
practical functional response, but then that can inform, I think, refinements in the weight of a typeface or the contrast of the typeface. And I think once, you know, variable font technology is very, uh, it's still kind of unreliable with print uh, public, uh, applications, I think. I mean, it exists in InDesign, but I know a lot of people have kind of, it, it, it needs to be, it needs to cascade across the entire industry, right? Like the, like all the printers need to have Adobe, like the latest version of Adobe, et cetera. Like you, it might work on your own computer, but anyway, um, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say is that like once that, once that is consistent, then I think it can actually offer a lot of opportunities for typographic finesse um, in print as well. Um, and um, yeah, I, I don't have as many sort of like projects as an example for this, like using variable fonts in print yet, but I do imagine like being able to still create interesting experiences across time, like, you know, books are still are a, a one-way medi medium in a sense, but there's still kind of like a passage of time that happens um, as you flip a page. And perhaps, yeah, I think Chris Swift's idea of like scripting something where the, the typeface changes over the course of the pages, I think could be an interesting approach. I think there was a uh, recursive type stuff specimen was actually a flip book where I think they, the typefaces would change across an axis of variation across um, kind of this like chunky like animation tool with the, with the flip book. I think that was quite fun. Yeah, I think that there's there's definitely like still uh, room even if it's like a fixed media. Um, just thinking also like mm -hmm. the as you said, like the, the quality of paper, which which is uh, used to be a much, much yeah. more um, I mean, things have certainly gotten better, but but d depending on how you're printing, like um, it, there's still issues and in ink trapping, and mm -hmm. so certainly like mm -hmm. um, typefaces that adjust to um, the the substrate um, is is is, but yeah. also like the more poetic applications of how a typeface goes across multiple pages. You know, I completely agree. It's a it's a very mm -hmm. temporal experience, like flipping the page, the overlap of being able to go backwards and forwards. It's it's kind of an animated mm -hmm. tool as well. It's you know we kind of forget I think yeah. how expressive physical objects are and how much our human interaction is, is very much still in there. It's, it's kind of the UX is still there, but even if it's like feels like it's an analog object, but you know how it, it's still, there yeah. is a human on the other side. <laughs> Definitely. Um, um, I think uh, we probably had a good stopping point. Uh, Marie, thank you so much for, for sharing your insight and, and, and these wonderful ideas. And I, I, I am sure you planted a lot of really good seeds in people's minds to, uh, to see where this can go. And I, I hope people are inspired to, to make fun projects and, uh, and push this field a little further along and to bring this like um, playfulness and poeticism into, into this field, which is, is really fascinating to see. So again, thank you for joining us from, uh, from Barcelona and for, uh, you know, and uh, for folks watching, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, the recording will be updated uh, and uploaded to Vimeo, but the, this link that's at the top, the YouTube, um, you can just click on that. Uh, it will open up in your browser and you can play back it, it'll stay you could already scrub backwards so it's it's there and you will certainly have it as, as an archive so thanks for everyone for joining us again marie thank you so much for for your wonderful presentation um and thanks for so folks who are here me. yeah and uh don't forget the 25th is our last summer talk and then uh we'll see everyone